When 1948 began, support for President Harry Truman was sinking. His approval rating had dipped into the 30s, and hope for a second term seemed fleeting. This was the man who in 1945, just three months into his vice presidency, was catapulted into the White House and tasked with ending World War II. He himself said when he found out he was president, he felt like the sun, the moon, and all the planets had fallen on him. He did not want to be president. He didn't want the job. The happiest he ever was in politics was as a United States senator. Those, he has said repeatedly, were the happiest, most satisfying 10 years of his career. But once the job was his, he was determined to see it through. He wanted to be reelected. He wanted to be reelected in his own right. He'd inherited the White House. He had done his best. He thought he'd gotten some good work done. So he wanted to run again in 48. As much as Truman wanted it, his own party felt otherwise. There was a movement to replace him with Dwight D. Eisenhower. But Eisenhower refused, and Truman had to elbow his way to get the Democratic nomination. Senator Barkley and I will win this election and make these Republicans like it. Don't you forget that. Already unpopular, Truman dug himself a little deeper hole within the Democratic Party when he decided to back the desegregation of the U.S. Armed Services. One of the stories that, and I can't remember where I heard it, but I really like it, it was uh, Strom Thurmond in uh, South Carolina um, started worrying out loud about the desegregation thing with my grandfather. And one of his uh, colleagues said, well, what are you worried about Roosevelt saying the same thing? And Thurman, uh, Thurman said, yeah, but Truman means it. Two weeks after the Democratic National Convention, Truman issued an executive order, racially integrating the military. He didn't care what was popular. He did what he... George Elsie, who worked for him for years, told me on a couple of different occasions that he used to take Grandpa... When they had a problem, George was one of the guys who were tasked with finding solutions, giving him options. And George would take him several different options, and they'd sit down and... He'd say, all right, well, if you do this, you make the Republicans happy. If you do this, you can make the Democrats happy. If you do this, you're going to make big business happy. If you do, And Grandpa would stop him and say, look, what, what solves the problem what, for the most people? And George would say, well, that's, that's this one, but everybody's going to hate it. And that's invariably the one Grandpa would pick. Truman's decision to desegregate the military was so unpopular, it split the Democratic Party in three, and the Republican ticket led by New York Governor Thomas Dewey, seemed to have a clear path to victory in November. But with only three weeks until the election, Truman embarked on an ambitious tour of the United States, the Whistle Stop Campaign, traveling more than 21,000 miles by train, visiting dozens of cities and delivering hundreds of speeches. And they could see during the Whistle Stop campaign, the folks on the train could see the crowds getting bigger and getting more enthusiastic as they went along. They could see the momentum. For the media and Dewey, that momentum went nearly unnoticed. Mr. Dewey's great mistake was to sit back and believe that he had it in the bag. We now know that Governor Dewey will carry New York State by at least 50,000 votes and that he will be the next president of the United States. That's what most of the country assumed as voters went to the polls on November 2nd, 1948. I think the, uh, the three people who, who were staunchly believed my grandfather would win, my grandfather, my grandmother, and my mother, there was so much confidence behind Dewey's victory that the Chicago Tribune, led by Colonel Robert McCormick, published an edition before all the returns were in. The headline read, Dewey Defeats Truman. 1948 was uh, going to be a challenging year anyway. There was a, um, you know, a typographer strike. Uh, you know, Colonel McCormick did during that period of time is that he had to have a, a workaround so that um, they could get the newspaper uh, typeset. And that delayed, that really pushed back deadlines. But the real problem, I think, with uh, the, uh, the chain of events that was set in motion was that um, uh, the Tribune relied heavily on the 
predictions of the Washington bureau chief, Arthur Sears Henning, he was insisting that Dewey would, in fact, prevail. But Dewey did not prevail. And a few hours later, Truman pulled off what would later be regarded as the greatest upset in presidential election history. But by that time, 150,000 copies of the newspaper of the Chicago Tribune had been printed and distributed uh, far more than was claimed at the time, which was about 30,000. McCormick sent every trib, any employee he could get his hands on out to get those papers back, to retrieve those papers, to, to minimize the mistake. It was a pretty stunning uh, 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 false headline in and of itself and to have that picture of a triumphant Harry Truman with an ear-to-ear -ear smile holding up that paper on the back of the, the train. I think the train was the Ferdinand Magellan in St. Louis two days after the election was just part of the, what made it such a, uh, a, a, a unique part of the American political lore. It was a fitting moment of triumph for a man who, for the better part of a year, was the subject of extensive doubt predicted almost universally to suffer defeat. In your hands rests our future. Truman is America's choice to deal with the vast problems of today.